I am a little bit different. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see, my talk today is going to revolve around various issues that have to do with our recent discovery uh, of this uh, gigantic uh, late Middle Kingdom royal sarcophagus chamber uh, last sum summer at South Abydos. Uh, this has been a case of, I like to think of it sort of as archaeological dominoes. Um, the discovery of this chamber uh, has led to one thing after another, which uh, has added some interesting new texture to our understanding of South Abydos, um, especially the, the, the royal activities that uh, went on there over the course of the late Middle Kingdom uh, and on through the Second Intermediate Period. Um, uh, just to write you, a number of previous speakers have talked about the site. Um, uh, the, the area I'm talking about is uh, the southern extension of Abydos, uh, between the cliffs and the, the Nile floodplain. Uh, here this area extends uh, between uh, a, a very impressive sort of symmetrical uh, peak in the desert cliffs uh, that we know anciently was called Anubis Mountain. Uh, between there and the edge of the floodplain, we have this very large uh, complex of Saint Wazir III, uh, built around 1850 BC in the 12th Dynasty with its various components that we've been investigating uh, over the last 20 years or so, in fact. Um, one of the things that we have been doing um, in recent seasons as part of the work at South Abydos uh, is looking for evidence for private tombs. Um, just to go back to the previous slide, uh, a lot of our efforts in recent years have been devoted to the excavation of the large uh, settlement site, which you see there in the schematic uh, on the lower left-hand side, uh, not far from the mortuary temple of St. Wazir III. Uh, we have there a very large uh, planned settlement site, very similar to Lahun. Uh, probably uh, a lot of it actually not preserved because of the growth of the Nile floodplain, uh, but it's a very substantial population uh, that uh, was established around 1850 BC um, and continued for the better part of uh, two and a half centuries. A large local population, uh, where were the cemeteries of these people? Um, so it initiated a, um, a survey and excavation project. Um, part of the results of that Kevin spoke about earlier uh, with uh, the, the discovery of some of the New Kingdom uh, cemetery areas. Um, essentially looking for the location of these private tombs of the population of South Abydos. Um, we've looked all over the place. Uh, we've used geophysical techniques as well as excavation. Uh, thus far, we actually have uh, yet to find a single late Middle Kingdom private tomb at South Abydos. Where the heck these people have been buried? I have no idea yet. Uh, we have some good, uh, good possibilities. Uh, last summer, one of the areas that we were drawn to, to examine was actually up uh, near the base of the cliffs, adjacent to the mortuary enclosure of San Wazir III. The reason for this is that we had done geo uh, geophysical work, magnetometry, uh, back in 2002-2003, uh, um, and there in the upper left-hand side you see some of the, the shadows of structures that are adjacent to some of the larger tombs that we already knew about. Uh, we wanted to uh, open this up and get a sense of what these may be. The possibility seemed uh, to be there that they may be uh, private tombs of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, so the excavation was underway uh, last summer. Uh, we uh, exposed in this area some, uh, some pretty impressive tombs. Um, a number of them had actually been uh, examined a century ago by Arthur Weigall. Um, these are essentially kind of um, a pretty sizable, uh, not large, but substantial uh, kind of passage tombs that have a series of chambers that uh, descend down into the desert substructure. Uh, culminating in a, a final a terminal burial chamber, uh, usually lined in stone that you see here. Um, so we excavated six of these structures um, uh, during the summer. Um, uh, very little in terms of artifactual con uh, contents to actually date them, which was very frustra frustrating for us. Uh, but then came this uh, sort of surprising, um, unpredicted discovery. Uh, one, of these one of these tombs had actually, uh, rather than having a built chamber uh, made out of stone uh, masonry blocks, uh, had actually reused a large uh, quartzite sarcophagus chamber uh, dating to the late uh, Middle Kingdom. And here you see the excavations of this structure. We were pretty astounded to come upon this thing. Um, it just seemed entirely out of context. You know, associated with one of these brick tombs. Um, it's a really massive piece of stone, um, 60 tons, give or take a pound or two, uh, thereabouts. Uh, uh, what we evidently had was a, a massive uh, royal sarcophagus chamber that for some reason had been reused in association with a secondary tomb context. Uh, so you see the excavation uh, going, uh, going on around it. Uh, the structure was um, exposed over the period of several weeks. Um, here you see the, the red quartzite from which it's made. 
uh, pretty impressive in scale. This is um, the type of sarcophagus chamber. This is actually the first example of this that's been found uh, really since the 1950s uh, with the discovery uh, of the, the pyramid of uh, Mene Kemo, uh, Dashur. Um, here we have um, uh, a uh, massive uh, stone that was designed essentially to house a royal burial, uh, two recesses uh, joining each other, one for the sarcophagus itself. Um, the, on the right hand side and on the left hand side of the recess for the uh, canopic chest. Um, so um, the stone from which it's made um, is uh, red quartzite from the Jebel Ahmar quarries uh, to the northeast of Cairo. Um, this massive block had come uh, over 300 miles south to Abydos at some point um, and had ended up ultimately in this uh, kind of secondary context. Um, just to give you a sense of it, many of you are familiar with this uh, basic uh, form of royal burial crypt uh, that develops in the late uh, Middle Kingdom. Um, it characterizes a number of royal pyramids uh, from the time of Hawara. This is what you might call the post-Hawara type of royal burial, a massive um, stone containing the actual sarcophagus and canopic chest uh, covered and sealed by an equally massive block intended to uh, protect uh, the chamber and its contents from robbers. Um, what do you do with a giant sarcophagus chamber once you've excavated it and documented and photographed it? Well, they're quite a lot of fun, actually. So um, there's a lengthy photo series. I only put in one or two here. Uh, here's one of the uh, Penn grad students, uh, Shelby Justel, uh, being discovered by uh, Arias and the Goofies. Um, and everybody did this, of course, including the Goofies and many of the world. Um, uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, uh, this work was going on in June, so it was nice and toasty warm. Uh, our inspector, one of his suggestions was that uh, maybe we should just fill it all up with water. And we this <laughs> uh, it was very tempting, but uh, we didn't do that. Um, uh, but we did do this. Uh, we, we, were, we were wondering how many people could actually fit into the royal sarcophagus chamber uh, of the late Middle Kingdom. It turns out uh, about 30 or more guys uh, inside and on the edges. So there's most of the guys involved actually in the excavation of the chamber. Um, at the end of this work, um, we were really interested in the question of um, uh, the original ownership of the tomb. Uh, two questions posed themselves. Um, really, uh, where did this chamber come from originally? Who was the original royal owner? Um, and uh, who then was the individual who had moved this? This represents a kind of massive investment in um, you know, in manpower, very obviously it would have been a very uh, visible aspect of the local landscape to uh, remove this from its, its original context um, and reestablish it in this uh, particular setting. So um, uh, we had uh, returned um, to Abydos um, in the winter time uh, with those two questions in mind. Um, and one of the things that we had immediately realized upon discovering this is the likely uh, original context. <coughs> Uh, not far uh, from the discovery of the royal sarcophagus chamber, just a little bit off the plan there, actually on the left-hand side, um, is uh, one of two very large late Middle Kingdom royal tombs, which are satellite tombs to the larger tomb enclosure of San Wazir III. Um, uh, originally uh, examined 100 years ago by Arthur Weigall, um, uh, he found uh, in one of these, a tomb we call S9, which is the more complete one there on the right-hand side, um, he found a very uh, well-preserved interior, including a sarcophagus chamber very similar to this one. It's still in place there. Um, but uh, the further one on the left-hand side, what we call tomb S10, um, he had uh, gone down in the interior uh, looking for evidence of the burial chamber um, and said that he couldn't find it anywhere. He found what he thought were fragments of the smashed lid, uh, but couldn't find the actual chamber. Um, so we realized very quickly that this is un undoubtedly uh, the original burial chamber uh, from this tomb, S10. Uh, it had traveled uh, just a, sh a short distance, actually. Um, so here's S10, uh, its interior right here, the location of the sarcophagus chamber found over here, um, about 50 or 60 meters away. Um, uh, but really kind of a, a major job um, in terms of extracting this and moving it um, across the landscape. Um, so uh, when we went back um, uh, during the winter season, uh, we began to tackle um, this question uh, of tomb S10 itself. Um, we initiated excavation uh, on both the interior and the, the, the area in the front of it, uh, looking for evidence of the internal architecture, any objects that may be associated with that, um, as well as uh, the possibility of a chapel and other features. 
uh, associated with it. And what we found is that um, this tomb, S10, is actually um, a, a sort of a miniaturized version of the much larger tomb enclosure of St. Wazir III. Um, we essentially have a sort of a T-shaped enclosure um, in the, the center of this is the actual tomb. Um, uh, most of what's preserved is uh, subterranean, but originally there seems to have been a pyramidal uh, superstructure on top of it. Um, and then in front of this, um, uh, you see here this projection sort of uh, echoing the much larger projection of the St. Wazard enclosure uh, with features that directly echo it, including this uh, building on the front, which may be a sort of a ritual or purification building uh, used in the funerary rites. Um, uh, one of the things that's very striking uh, about uh, these uh, two satellite tombs at South Abydos, adjacent to the tomb of St. Wazard III, um, is the uh, remarkable similarity in size and design that they have uh, with one particular royal pyramid of the 13th dynasty, and this is the pyramid of Ameni Kemal. Um, the interiors of these, uh, the schematic doesn't really allow you to appreciate it entirely, but really the, um, the design, the scale, and everything um, is almost like a carbon copy. Um, uh, and so, uh, in studying these, um, we were interested in uh, identifying who the owners of these two tombs may be at South Abydos. These are essentially kind of Memphite style royal burials uh, that have been constructed adjacent to the tomb enclosure of St. Wazir III at South Abydos. Um, uh, the air, uh, the chronologically the area we were looking, uh, the, the time frame with, um, we consider most likely um, is this transitional period uh, from the late 12th uh, into the earliest 13th dynasty. Um, there you see the, uh, uh, the time frame for uh, the Pyramid of Ameni Kemal, um, dating just several years uh, into uh, the 13th dynasty, and we went back uh, specifically looking uh, for evidence in this time frame, uh, particularly the first couple reigns of the 13th dynasty. Uh, we've been rewarded with some interesting evidence um, as to the original owner of this uh, sarcophagus chamber. Um, we uh, initiated work on the tomb itself. Um, here's the entrance to the tomb, uh, which really allows you to appreciate the, the the significant scale of this. Um, this is a lot the limestone uh, entrance passage uh, fronted by a brick uh, staircase that leads down into it. Um, there you see that uh, exposure of the actual entrance into it. Uh, we have a lot to do yet. Uh, we haven't actually reached uh, the inner kind of central area where uh, the sarcophagus chamber presumably once was located. Uh, but it's really nice preservation, uh, bits and pieces of things that uh, give us just a sense of uh, a uh, once richly equipped royal tomb assemblage. Uh, things that must have been dropped sort of uh, in the passages at some point by tomb robbers. Um, here's just a little bit of a uh, gypsum coated piece of wood uh, with a series with a, a, board, a, a star border, a frieze. You can see the five pointed stars with a, a gilding on top of that, uh, possibly part of the lid of a a canopic chest or sarcophagus or a frieze, uh, something like that. I'm just sitting along the edge of the, uh, the entrance passage. A number of other fragments uh, similarly reflected this original material in the burial um, and the um, robbery process. Um, so there's, there's uh, the, exposure, the exposure of the interior. Uh, the other really fascinating area we, uh, we looked at in trying to understand uh, this sarcophagus chamber and its original context was the front of the tomb. And here you see, uh, we spent quite a lot of time actually cutting away vast debris mounds that had been left by Weigall um, and others, uh, including a Milano who had uh, puttered around here a little bit uh, back in the 19th century. Um, we, we were rewarded with the discovery um, of these very badly um, uh, eroded but very informative structures that include this uh, probable purification building on the front. Um, and there you see just the excavation of those structures going on. Um, and uh, in, uh, in this area, um, really kind of uh, from the central part um, of the projection, uh, we found evidence that essentially at some point, um, uh, probably after the, uh, the final closure of the tomb entrance, um, the place had been covered over by a brick floor um, and a uh, votive or, or chapel uh, installation had been installed. Uh, we found architectural indications of this as well as uh, uh, the, this very fragmentary stela, limestone stela, um, originally very substantial in height, um, probably uh, something like four or four and a half feet, uh, based on the scale of the figure, uh, with the seated king. Uh, you can see him there with his um, hand uh, out on his, uh, projecting over his lap, and also his elbow, uh, just visible, and the bull's tail, um, 
actually just a little bit of that is visible uh, coming off of uh, the front of his, uh, his kilt, uh, and inscriptional elements um, that I identify a king by the name of Sobek Hotep. Um, at this point, we have uh, the king's nomen, Sobek Hotep. Um, that was very exciting. Of course, when you find a Sobek Hotep in the 13th dynasty, it's not time to celebrate yet. Um, there's seven or eight of them in the 13th dynasty, so uh, to confirm the specific identity, one uh, does need uh, further evidence, uh, the pre nomen or other elements of the titulary. Um, thus far, we have not conclusively, I think, proven that this is um, Sobek Hotep the first. Um, however, there's actually a, a wider set of evidence uh, that I don't have time to go into in detail, uh, artifacts and architectural considerations uh, that suggest that uh, this tomb dates to the very beginning of the 13th dynasty. Um, almost certainly its, uh, its builder um, is uh, Sobek Hotep the first, the first king of the 13th dynasty, um, or uh, uh, as he's often known, uh, Sobek Hotep. Uh, second Ray Hutawi. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, that's the uh, probable identification um, of the owner of the sarcophagus chamber itself. The other uh, interesting connection um, uh, that developed uh, from uh, this follow up work to the discovery of the sarcophagus chamber of Sobek Hotep, probably Sobek Hotep I, um, was the fact that his uh, chapel area in front of his tomb. Uh, had been in fact extensively cut about um, and uh, cut through by a, a number a number of uh, intrusive structures, one of which we examined uh, this season, um, the second half of the season. Um, and here we came upon uh, a, another example of this uh, passage style of tomb that we had found in uh, the summertime, just like the, the tomb that the sarcophagus chamber um, had been reused within. Uh, we came upon another example of that. Um, here you see the entrance to it, um, a little bit of a variation actually on the design. Um, you can see a, a beautifully constructed uh, limestone portcullis which represents the, the initial entry um, into a series of chambers that descend to a final burial chamber. Um, and here, um, just a, a handful of meters in front of the tomb of Sobek Hotep, probably the first, uh, we came upon um, a really unique discovery. Um, a tomb of a second intermediate period king, um, and even more than that, a decorated tomb of a second intermediate king. This is uh, King Moser Ibre Senebkai, um, a king probably of the, uh, the latter part of the second intermediate period, um, who built his tomb in a similar design to the ones that we had found and examined in the summertime, uh, but this one uh, with some interesting uh, aspects added to it. Um, this has been a very exciting discovery, of course. Um, an unknown pharaoh um, has he's attracted quite a bit of interest, of course, uh, from uh, all angles. Um, uh, it was uh, quite quite exciting um, the day after the uh, Min uh, Ministry of State for Antiquities announced the discovery uh, of the tomb. Uh, the following day, uh, he actually had a Wikipedia page that someone posted. <laughs> uh, so, in a matter of hours, he went from being an unknown pharaoh to a pharaoh whose existence is uh, accessible and known to everyone around the globe um, at the speed of light. Uh, here's his, um, his identification. Um, uh, he is the, the good god, the lord of the two lands, the lord of ritual, the king of upper and lower Egypt, Woser Ibre, or Usur Ibre, if you prefer, the son of Re, uh, Senebkai, um, and some of the decoration uh, of his burial chamber. Um, the, the excavation of the tomb of Senebkai has been uh, really interesting uh, from a number of angles. One is that uh, the stone burial chamber that you just saw, uh, the decorated elements uh, uh, connect uh, with the, 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 that, that kid, the, the king's decoration itself, but one, one of the features of this tomb that uh, does relate uh, very closely with the tombs that we had examined previously is that all of the masonry in this tomb uh, is actually reused blocks. Um, these are uh, limestone blocks that originally were, were parts of Middle Kingdom funerary chapels. Um, we have all types of uh, different decoration. Um, just to an, an example there on the left of a seated figure, um, extensive uh, uh, text with names and titles. Um, there's a, a whole series of different scene types, in fact. All of these blocks evidently taken from somewhere else at Abydos and reused in the burial chamber of Senebkai. Um, uh, elements of the, actually the roofing, um, this is a, a huge uh, 11th dynasty funerary stela with an autobiographical inscription on it. Um, really fascinating uh, text. Uh, we haven't yet recovered all 
bits of it, but um, uh, it looks to be a, a quite interesting text. Um, and there you just see uh, the excavation of that uh, particular element. Uh, so uh, here's the burial chamber. Um, reused masonry from earlier Middle Kingdom uh, structures, uh, probably brought elsewhere from Abydos uh, to compose the burial chamber of this second intermediate king, uh, Oser Ibre Senebkai. Um, the decorative program is um, relatively simple, but really um, it's a really sort of impactful, uh, symbolic religious program. Uh, essentially what you see is four goddesses here, uh, two on the back wall who flank an image of the, uh, the Canopic Shrine of Senebkai. Um, these are Neef and Newt uh, on left and right. Um, and you can see it's uh, surmounted by the, uh, the winged sun disk, uh, the, the Bechdatite, uh, it's labeled in fact. Uh, and uh, on the side walls, uh, two other goddesses with their arms up raised. Um, what we have here actually are the four goddesses who protect the canopic shrine of the king, uh, but also in, in, on the front and the side walls, these ladies with their arms up raised. Uh, these are Isis and Nephthys. Um, and actually the program uh, probably uh, very beautifully ties in with the original disposition of the canopic chest, uh, which would have been at the back wall, um, and the sarcophagus, which would have been flanked by Isis and Nephthys on, on either side, uh, protecting it. Um, so it's been a, a very interesting thing to examine. Um, I don't really have time to go into too much detail on it. Um, one of the fascinating things about the burial of Senebkai is that the, these goddesses evidently didn't do their job very well, um, <laughs> because in fact the tomb was plundered uh, in ancient times. Um, and in this uh, chamber here, this is actually the second chamber of the tomb, uh, we came upon uh, the, rem the remains uh, that had been uh, pulled out by tomb robbers uh, from the burial chamber itself, including uh, uh, the remains of Senebkai, uh, which you see there uh, as we recovered them. I'll skip over that for uh, interest in time. Um, and then uh, the canopic uh, chest itself, which is uh, made out of uh, cedar wood. Uh, but very interestingly, um, and this now ties us back to the uh, issue of the sarcophagus chamber, um, inscriptions on this, uh, painted inscriptions, um, uh, which we found very puzzling when we came upon them, uh, don't actually have the name of Senebkai, uh, but rather uh, they're painted with uh, the name Sobekhotep. Um, this, these are cedar planks that have been reused from uh, probably part of the, the inner wooden coffin uh, of the adjacent, taken from the adjacent tomb of Sobekhotep, uh, reconfigured um, into a canopic chest for Senebkai. Um, so, there you see that in the process of excavation. Um, I will, well, yeah, let's go forward to there. Um, identifying this king, uh, placing him uh, chronologically, uh, uh, really revolves around some of the, uh, the major evidence we have uh, for the sequence of dynasties and kings in the very problematic history of the second intermediate period. Um, the most probable uh, position for him um, is in uh, the beginning of this very uh, broken section of the Turin king list, um, this is column 11, uh, where you have actually at the top uh, the kings of the 16th dynasty, um, who are then given a tally, a, there's a summation, um, and then there's a, a transition to a, a new series of kings, uh, very broken, and the main section of that, as you can see, is missing, uh, but initiated by two kings uh, whose, uh, whose uh, praenomen was uh, Woser something Ray. Um, this seems to be uh, the position that we probably should put uh, this king, uh, Senebkai, in. Um, and uh, I am uh, tending to, towards uh, thinking that um, the evidence that we found at South Abydos is a very strong confirmation, in fact, for um, a regional dynasty, um, as originally proposed by Detlef Franca, um, expanded the arguments and analysis and discussion of this, expanded by Kim Reiholt. Um, a uh, separate dynasty contemporary with uh, the Theban 16th dynasty, uh, which uh, runs contemporary essentially with the, the, the 15th dynasty, the Hyksos dynasty in northern Egypt. Um, uh, we have the evidence of the Turin king list uh, for this, as well as some independent uh, commemorative objects from Abydos itself, um, including this pretty famous steel on the left in the British Museum uh, of Wekwaut Emsaf. Um, and then a very intriguing one that I, I'm just going to sort of close up with here, um, uh, that names a, a king who is otherwise entirely unattested. Um, his name is Pian Cheni, uh, which means the one of Phinus, um, a, a distinctly sort of Aberdeen sounding name for a king. Um, and um, uh, in terms of uh, 
where uh, Seneca relates uh, to uh, this particular uh, dynasty and sequence of kings. Um, based on his position in the Turin king list, uh, we can probably uh, position him as uh, the first or second king uh, at the beginning uh, of a dynasty that um, is of, of currently of debatable duration. Um, uh, Reichelt uh, originally uh, argued that this dynasty uh, probably is relatively modest in length, uh, something like 20 years, uh, but we can probably, uh, I think, uh, look at this uh, in, in, in terms of maybe representing a much more robust uh, line of kings, uh, largely uh, contemporaneous with the 16th dynasty. These are all uh, aspects that we hope to uh, resolve uh, and examine further. Um, but um, what we are looking at essentially is uh, the local necropolis of a series of uh, kings um, who uh, are essentially kind of regional rulers of the uh, uh, Aberdeen region, the finite region uh, during the second intermediate period. Uh, Senebkai is one of them. Um, the other tombs, uh, we don't yet have uh, identifications of course, and we, uh, we have some indications there are additional ones uh, that uh, may flesh out our evidence for this. Uh, but my final slide is this one. Um, I'm very intrigued uh, in uh, the evidence that we've retrieved from, from South Abydos for uh, essentially a, a, a period of uh, reuse and uh, almost sort of cannibalization uh, of materials that are associated with uh, the earlier uh, tomb uh, of Sobek Hotep, um, probably the first, um, adjacent to the necropolis of these kings of the Abydos dynasty. Uh, we see this um, in the canopic uh, chest in uh, Senebkai's tomb with uh, earlier inscriptions of Sobek Hotep. Um, originally those were all covered over. This was a gilded uh, canopic chest, the, the gilding is gone. Um, we also see this reuse in the, um, the, the large sarcophagus chamber uh, being taken out um, from uh, tomb S10 and reused uh, presumably in the tomb of another one uh, of the royal members of this uh, family. So, uh, there you see that again. Um, and it's interesting to consider this uh, when we see the stela of this uh, uh, king, uh, Pan Cheni, uh, found at Abydos, um, possibly to be allocated to the Abydos dynasty. Um, a fascinating element of his titulary, recorded in the lunette there that you see, is that he actually uh, took uh, the pre uh, of Sobek Hotep I, uh, second Ra Kotawi. Um, it's almost like adding insult to injury. They were taking uh, all these things from uh, Sobek Hotep's tomb. Uh, one of the kings, presumably, is also uh, taking Sobek Hotep's uh, prenum. And, uh, so it's an interesting case of uh, sort of um, connecting uh, these kings, connecting themselves um, with um, earlier, uh, an earlier late uh, Middle Kingdom ruler, um, but uh, also in the process uh, reusing uh, many elements uh, from that tomb, and it's a, certainly a, a signature of the probably uh, confined, uh, uh, circumscribed economic uh, and political context of this particular dynasty of kings. So as we continue work in coming years, um, we hope to uh, continue to uh, define this uh, particular group of kings on the basis of the tombs of South Abydos. So um, there we will bid them farewell, and it's that time of the day, of course. Um, so you guys must obey the goddess um, and uh, do as she tells you. Thank you very much. Thank you.